Hello, everyone. Pleasure once again. Let's talk with Dr. Greg. We are here. I am so excited about this interview. You know, um, well, first, let me say thank you all for your support. I appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you listening to me. I appreciate everything that you have done to help. Let's talk with Dr. Greg. Uh, grow to the point where we are, we are moving into phase two. I know what it takes to be a champion. And I've always said to myself that when we talk about champion, it should not be only about how fast you run, how high you jump, how far you jump. It should be also about your character. It should be about your personality. It should be how you are able to influence others and make a difference in a positive way in people's life. And when I watch this young man perform back in the days, I'm telling you, I usually get goosebumps because I saw the character of a champion. I saw the qualities of a champion. I saw the mind of a champion. And because of that, I wanted to, to know what he knew. And I was hoping that he too will use his information, his knowledge, his experience, and influence others to become the best version of themselves. So, as usual, I prepared um, an introduction. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to play the introduction, and then I am going to bring Mike on stage. Let's go. <music> Passionate, determined, resilient, and humble are some of the adjectives that best describe this two-time world champion and world record holder, Michael Anthony Powell. Michael is one of the greatest long jumper in the history of the sport. He is known to compete with passion, resilience, and tenacity. Like most champions, Michael dislikes losing, and because of that, he is always prepared to give his best effort when he competes. And he is never afraid to fight to the end, because that is what true champions do. In 1988, Michael won his first Olympic silver medal in Seoul, South Korea. When many thought Michael was broken after the loss, he bounced back with more enthusiasm than before. In 1991, at the World Championship in Tokyo, Japan, Michael crushed the previous world record set by Bob Beeman to win his first World Championship title. In 1992, at the Barcelona Olympic, Michael managed to finish second behind Carl Lewis in another competitive battle. Despite competing with an injury, Michael just never quit. In 1993 at the Stuttgart World Championship, Michael once again reigned supreme by destroying the field and winning his second consecutive World Championship title. A year later, he captured the 1994 Goodwill Games Championship. Michael continued to share his insights and ways of thinking to help young people achieve their highest potential in their lives. And therefore, it is truly my honor and privilege to welcome this man, this warrior, a great person, a superior athlete, and a champion to the stage. Let me hear it for this two-time world champion and world record holder, Michael Anthony Powell. <laughs> how are you, <laughs> Michael? How are you today? You're doing dark. <laughs> it is a pleasure to have you on this program, man. You know, when you come and let's talk with Dr. Greg, it's not about me, it's about you. You know, I'm, and I always want to I always want to have a good a PhD in something. So I don't care. <laughs> I just want to be Dr. Powell in something. <laughs> well, in my book, you are anything you want to be today. Um 
before we actually go into the interview, Michael, our guests usually get the opportunity to make a shout out to whomever they please, or they may uh, take the time to market any venture of their choice. Is there anyone you would like to acknowledge before we actually go into the interview? Uh, I mean, not necessarily, man. I just always try to be positive and, and just like, you know, just, just try to put positive stuff out there and, 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 and try to be a, a positive influence on the world, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm doing whatever little way I can, you know, I don't, I don't um, have any type of official ministry or anything, but I like to consider my coaching, my ministry, you know, so I just try to, you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, spitting verses or anybody or anything, you know, but just by example, you know, I just try to show the young athletes how great of a sport that we have and, and how to carry it on. Mm, I appreciate that because that is one of my purpose too, to help to influence the next generation so they can, for one, appreciate great athletes like yourself, and two, they can learn from some of your ups and downs, apply to themselves, and also become champions and world record holder um, like yourself. <laughs> part they don't want to understand you got to learn you got to learn from us because that's how we that's how i got here i learned from the people in front of me and they told me that i could do it and i believed it and i did it Mm -hmm. that's why like i go out there and i just try to try to be positive and i instill positivity and belief in all my athletes because most time that's the only thing that's missing is that belief Mm -hmm. so true um, Mike, for all the people who are on the platform now and who will watch this at a later date, tell us, where in Philadelphia were you born and did you grow up there? We're, we're in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, yeah. Yeah. And did you grow up there in Philadelphia? Yeah. I was, um, I was, uh, my mom and my, all my family, my mom and stuff went to high school called Chamberlain. And then, so um, I would have been in Overbrook High School in Philly. I would have been going to school with Will Smith. <laughs> so same neighborhood as, as Kobe Bryant, you know, West Philly. So um, I kinda, it's kind of a, a special place, you know. So even though I left there when I was young, I still kind of, I got that Philly vibe to me, though. So then I moved to L.A. So kind of combination in Philly and L.A. is not bad. Yeah. Well, for, for some of the people who are not from America, are not from Philly, what was life like as a young boy growing up in Philly? Philadelphia, you know, I live I live in the inner city and stuff, so there was not really any type of program stuff for education, I mean, for back sports or anything like that. So I wasn't really involved in sports. I was just kind of like, really kind of, kind of getting in trouble, but just really looking for something to do, like create my own activities. So I would throw rocks at cop cars and they chase me and get away. You know, stuff like that. But um, I moved to Los Angeles when I was um, 11. So, um, you know, I left that environment. I came to California, always sunshine. Everybody's always playing sport, no matter what time of year it is, just, that's the sport you play. So that's when I started playing sports while I really moved, I moved to California. And then I just kind of, I. Uh, but one thing happened, happened in Philadelphia. I, I, I remember I was playing a stickball game this is, you know, really big in the inner city. Mm-hmm. You know, and we were playing against this other street. And I was a young guy, but I was so fast, I got the hand with the older guys because they couldn't get away from me. So we're playing this game. I'm up for a bat, the last of bat. And these guys in the outfield sat down because I was a young guy. They didn't think I could do anything. And I got mad and I hit a home run. And the guys picked me up and carried me off, off, the, off the field on their shoulders. And I was like, I like this sports thing. So from that point on, I always want to excel in sports, and that was my way of, of getting attention. Mm. Well, well, I, I, and sometimes that's what young people need. They need that extra motivation to start believe in themselves. But mm. moving from Philly to South, the southern part of California, some people would say that was a drastic change of environment. What was your experience like, and did you enjoy the heat? Oh yeah, I found out. I mean, I don't like the cold. I don't like the cold. No, I'm good. I'm good on that. And um, culturally, it was a big change for me because I lived like inner city Philadelphia. I didn't know any white people. Only white people I knew were the police and teachers. You know, so I came to California. You know, it was a mixed culture and stuff. So it was a culture shock for me, but it was good. You know, it was a good experience for me. I didn't have really good experiences in Philadelphia. So 
I got a chance to just kind of like assimilate and just, you know, immerse myself in all different cultures in California. And it's, you know, white culture, Hispanic culture, the Asian culture, you know, Filipino culture, you know, it's all type of stuff, you know, and just not, not to mention just the cultures within black society and black culture and stuff. So I've always been really interested in people. Mm -hmm. Like I really like California because it's a melting pot of everybody. And it is so true. Who and what would you say was your inspiration that influenced you to become an athlete? Um, that's really easy. Um, Willie Banks, <laughs> former world record holder in the triple jump. I was when I moved to California. I remember I was, I was in like sixth grade. And I was watching the competition on television. Not there you go. All right, now I'm back on. All right. I was saying that call was Willie Banks. Willie was calling <laughs> me. <laughs> but um, yeah, Willie um, was competing at UCLA and he was a freshman at UCLA and they were competing against USC and attracting on television. And I was watching the television and it, and it came down to the last the last um, event. And if Willie won the competition, he was going to win the meet. Track was really, really big back then. Even this dual meet had 15,000 people and was on television. It was really, really big. Mm -hmm. So Willie not only won the triple jump and won the competition, he broke the national record. And like my experience as a little kid back in Philly, they picked him up and carried him off the field <laughs> on the shoulders. And I'm like, I'm going to be like that guy. I'm going to the Olympics and I'm going to um, go to UCLA. And um, as time went on, you know, I got a chance to, um, I didn't go, I didn't go to UCLA. I got a chance to go there later though. Mm -hmm. you know and then willie and i end up being like best friends and training partners so dreams come true you know a lot of people dream and they never get the chance yeah but i think i missed you turn your mic back on again yes so i say a lot of people dream yeah I'm on, i still don't hear you yeah it's on can you hear me now no oh. i know mine is on i, I can hear last you on the first time i hear you either yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. I'm not sure. Let me see something. Oh, man. Can you hear me now? Oh. All right. <laughs> so, so, so I was saying that it is important that young people learn to dream too because sometimes when we dream, it is the only thing that keeps us alive. And you were able to dream about this, put the work in, and you were able to manifest things that people only <laughs> dream about. Um, what high school did you attend? And I, I would love for you to enlighten those who are watching. What sport did you participate in? And how well did you perform? Well, I, in my high school, I was primarily a basketball player. Um, I was like getting recruited to play college basketball. I was um, academic, all American, and all everything. But I was a point guard, and I couldn't dribble very well. In my left hand, athletically, you know, nobody could stop me. I was dunking from the free throw line, all kind of craziness. But I just couldn't dribble very well. So um, I had to choose between track and basketball. And actually, I went to UC Irvine thinking that I was going to do both sports, but when I got there, it didn't work out. Hmm. Hmm. I can tell you this, Mike, uh, and for a lot of Jamaicans too, if we did not get a scholarship from a U.S. college, I don't know what would have happened to me. Oh I don't goodness. know what would have happened to a whole lot of the, 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 the older generation, even the younger ones coming up now, because it gave me an opportunity to be somebody. Right. Um, I would like you to let the audience know, in, you said you went to California, Irvine, but did you actually got a scholarship to, to attend Irvine. Yeah, I got a half scholarship. And then um, my second year, they, they put me on full scholarship. And then um, I stayed one more season. Then I transferred to UCLA. I want to just get to a, a, a bigger a bigger environment, you know. So, um, you know, yeah, I transferred uh, to UCLA to be around just people. Like when I said I went to make the Olympic team, they wouldn't look at me like I was crazy. They would just say, oh, you mean like, like Jackie Joyner or like Flojo over there or whoever else it was. And at that time, 
at UCLA, UCLA was like the place to be. So whenever anybody came through LA, you had to roll to UCLA. If you was going to do a workout, you came through UCLA to work out. That's how it was back in the day. Mm. Well, who, who would believe that Mike Powell only received a half scholarship? <laughs> yeah, it was really weird. It was weird because I, I was beating athletes who got full scholarships in basketball and football. So I was like, what happened? You know, it's just the thing is, it's different now. Recruiting is different. And and back then, actually, what happened was uh, a junior college that's right here in, in the area where I grew up, uh, Mount Mount Sac, Mount San Antonio, some Mount Sac relays. Mm -hmm. But Mount Sac, they were telling people that I was going to go to school there and to keep hands off. And the thing is, I already got accepted to a UC school. I'm not going to go to a junior college, but they mm. thought they all was going to. And actually, they laid, they, they dangled a carrot out in front of me. Tom Telez came to my high school meet and he told me, we don't have money right now, but if you go to Mount Sac for a year, you can come to University of Houston and jump with Carl Lewis. And I was like, that sounds cool. I went home and asked my mom. She's like, nope. <laughs> Yeah, that was it. I was only 17, so I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Mike? A lot of time people believe that it is always smooth sailing for, for, for athletes when they go to college. Could you tell us some of the adversities that you face in terms of settling into college, in terms of the culture, and balancing your grades and your athletics? Well, you know, I was fortunate that um and that's what i think college is about it's about meeting people and I, I i had a great group of friends at uc irvine and at ucla who really kind of showed me what really what family was about and what loving was about and how to hug somebody and tell somebody i love you and and give some and kiss somebody i didn't come from that stuff so i learned a lot just about how to deal with people you know so i learned a lot and then and also just with the people i was around you know um I, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Alpha Phi Alpha, you know, so I'm a black fraternity. So I pledged, so I had a, 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 a abundant Greek life, you know, black Greek life at UC Irvine and at UCLA. So that was part of my experience too. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, you know, my experience in college was awesome. It was great because um, I was just living the dream, you know, getting paid to go to school and I appreciated it. And um, I just, you know, I wish I would have put more time in my studies because I just wasn't really focused on my studies. I mean, I mean, I, I graduated, you know, mm -hmm. somehow I got my degree, <laughs> you know, not, looking back, I didn't focus on it as much. I was really, I was really thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to get my degree, but I'm really here for track because I wasn't as focused. And, and sometimes people are like mad at me because they said, Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a student athlete. I said, I'm an athlete student. And they would get mad at me, especially the black people. And I said, just because I say one doesn't mean I can't do the other. It just means my focus <laughs> is on athletics. I'm still a good student, too. I can do more than one thing at once. So I speak my mind like that. So, And I've always been that way. And if people, hopefully people don't take it the right way, the wrong way. If they don't, though, it's okay because I stand behind what I say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I personally can relate to you because at one mm -hmm. point I knew track and field was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I did enough to get by in college. Right. And, and, right. and I'm sure most of us who perform well would come to some realization to say, look, that, did, that was the culture for us when we realized how talented we were. But in all honesty, though, could you remember the first time you flirted with the idea of becoming a professional long jumper? And also, when did you actually make that life-changing decision to realize that aspiration in stepping into the program? Well, when I was at uh, UC Irvine, my, my, my freshman year, you know, I, um, well, in, in high school, I jumped like seven, you know, um, I don't know, seven ten or something like that. And then I also high jumped to 17. I was more a high jumper. And then my sophomore, my sophomore year, um, you know, I turned, I turned, um, 19. Cause I was like, I, I, I turned, I went to college at 17. So during the season, I turned 19. I got older, more mature. The first jump of the season, my sophomore year, I went 805. 
And then the next one, I filed one that was about 8.35. Mm. So right from that moment, it was like, okay, Mike's headed towards Olympic future. So from the time I was 19, 1983, I remember it was like February, end of February. It changed my life because I realized that, okay, I can I can do something with this because I knew I was I was only just starting to learn. And I, mm-hmm. at that time, I did that jump. It was the number one jump in the world. Mm, okay. so I gained a lot of confidence and then people told me and the thing is I was a hooper I was I always had hops because nobody jump jump higher than me I was always dunking so for me I'm like this long jump I just gotta learn how to run I can can't nobody beat me in jumping mm. <laughs> let me learn how to run I'll get this so that's kind of what happened well you know one of the things I find with, with with a lot of us is that when we now make the decision to go pro that the transitioning is is not as easy as some people might think yeah and we find that a lot of athletes usually stumble at that phase moving from say college going straight into the pros the coach has to be right the environment has to be right the structure of the camp has to be right not to mention the almighty funding of the athletes everything i want you to tell us mike how was your transition was it smooth was it challenging? And what did you learn mm-hmm. in that process? Um, it, it was it was kind of hard, but you know, it's it's that point that makes or breaks a career. There's a lot of great athletes out there who have been Olympic champions, but they didn't make it through that transition period. Because when you're in college, you know, you have your whole system set up, you got your coach, your living situation, your finances, your friends, your girlfriend, your car, everything, every whole situation. Now, if you can trans, if you can just move into that situation and go, okay, now I'm going to be a professional. I got the same coach, same environment, much easier. But most people, now you got to find the coach. You got to find the right, the, the worst city am I going to be in? How am I going to, am I going to be able to finance myself? All that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the same time, trying to figure out, am I really good enough? You know, so for me, you know, I was drag. I graduated UCLA um, and then I got hurt in 86 and in 87, you know, I um, I, uh, I I was training by myself, basically. And um, I, I got number six in the world. I won one of the university games and I came back and I saw Willie Banks and I said, Willie, can I train with you? And he is like, why should I let you train with me? Because, you know, Willie was really the man at the time, world mm-hmm. record holder. Mm-hmm. And I said, because I want to know what record holders do. And whatever you do, that's what I'm doing. If you say hop to practice on one leg, we hop into practice on one leg. Whatever you say, I'm your I'm your apprentice. I'm old school, man. That's how I learned. You want somebody learn from somebody, you got to be their apprentice. You got to give it up all yeah. the way. And that's and the thing is, tell you the truth, Greg. That's why on the world record now, man, don't nobody want to come give it up. Mm-hmm. I give it to them. I tell them. I can tell them. I can, all these guys, I can tell them right now what they're doing wrong, but they don't even want to come ask me. I'm like, fine. I just keep on being a world record holder then. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But that was tough. It was tough, though, making that transition. But then when I got with, with Willie, and then he introduced me to Randy Huntington. He introduced me to a training system. I was still broke as a joke, living at home, driving, just driving UCLA to make it. And then I made the Olympic team on my last jump, and that changed my life. Mm-hmm. You know, it changed everything. I, I like, I was teaching at the time at a school. I just finished, a, and I was going to go and teach. I said, okay, if I make the Olympic team, I'm going to jump. If I don't, I'm going to start teaching. I was already in the position to teach, mm-hmm. and I made the Olympic team on my last jump, and that changed, it changed my life. Wow. You see, sometimes a second can make a difference in a uh, life. A second, a fraction of a second, <laughs> a, a centimeter, you know, a, a, a bad decision. Man, there's so much that can go right and go wrong. Because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a world record holder, but I don't have a gold medal in the games. I should, but mm-hmm. I don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. I got you. I got you. I got you. And this mm-hmm. is why we hope that people will hear you, Mike, and realize that you're not that selfish type of guy who just want to hold everything for yourself. But no. you too want to give back and you want to share. Yeah. Your first Olympic game was in Seoul, South Korea, where you won your first Olympic silver medal behind legendary Carl Lewis. Yeah. What was the feeling like 
under the bright light battling with the big boys. Also, what Man, lesson was, did you take what? away from that Olympic? Was that the last part? What lesson did you take away from oh, okay. that Olympic experience? Well, Seoul was fun because, you know, the way the long jump was back in the day, if you're a top long jumper, top three, that means you're probably going to get a medal. You know, so I was number three. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get a bronze medal pretty much. And then during the competition, you know, I ended up, I had a jump and it didn't feel like very much. I turned around, I was a personal best on my 849. And that held up. And I ended up getting the silver. And it's really weird because right before the competition start, Carl Lewis came up to me and he said, hey, man, get a big jump out there early. And, man, you're going to shake Larry. And I was like, okay. So I went down there and jumped and I watched Larry. He started tripping. He was, he was shook, and he ended up getting the bronze. So Carl was, like, putting me up on game, but I know he's just trying to get rid of him, too. Carl, <laughs> Carl was always trying to work it, man. He was always trying to work it because even at the games, he was supposed to go first in the order, in the final. And then I, it was commotion going on, and he was over there trying to change it. And they're about to let him. And I ran over there. I was like, no. I said, no, man. I said, I looked at Carl. I said, no, nah, dude. I said, you already the best one. We're not making it easy for you. <laughs> and he looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, and you already know I'm crazy. I don't care. <laughs> I said, he's from he's from Jersey, too. I'm from Philly. You know when I get out, bro. Don't try that. You know, so, I said, I, I was the only one, though. Everybody else would let Carl do what he wanted to do. I'm like, yeah. why are you guys doing this? So he won, though. But at that time, I was like, I'm getting closer and closer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get him eventually. But right now, he's the man. But at least I got Larry. Now I'm second best. <laughs> so what was the relationship like, I would say, between you and Carl outside of competition? Well, I think from Carl's perspective, I was just the guy out there who was coming after him. And he might even like me and in, in the, in the, in, in, in like me a little bit. Mm -hmm. I hated him. <laughs> like with a real real passion like want to beat him up because that's how i got out you know yeah. what i'm saying my thing was yeah. like i was a skinny guy people you know trying to overlook me i gotta i gotta fight my way you under you don't you don't respect me so when carl came around it was a it was he was completely arrogant he made it really easy for me not to like him mm-hmm mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing is and i and i competed i mean some people can't compete well angry I competed very well angry because that's mm -hmm. how I competed. I was real, real fired up. So with, if Carl was around or not, even in my training, everything I did, if I was doing a bench press and I was getting tired, I'd be like, Carl, ah, ah, ah. you know, I was doing a drill. I work on my arm punch. I'm like, okay, I'm putting Carl's face right here. Boom, boom, boom. And that was all, everything was about beating Carl and breaking the world record. Everything was about that. Well, he he was indeed the man in the moment. Yeah, I tell people it's like jumping. It'd be like running against Bolt. Same mm -hmm. thing. That's how that's how he was. Mm -hmm. In 1991, at the World Championship in Tokyo, you came back after losing in um, 1988, and you end up defeating Carl, which he was the Olympic champion. But you also did it in world record fashion. What did it take? in terms of your training to perfect your technique so as to pull off such a magnificent performance amidst mm -hmm. all that pressure? Well, I mean, obviously a lot of hard work, you know, but, but when you have, when you have passion for something, I don't really call it work. I mean, I put a lot of extra work in and trying to figure out the technique. Cause my coach was, you know, Randy Huntington, you know, my coach Randy, you know, he's the one that's coaching that Chinese guy over in China runs night eight. He's a bad dude. He's been coaching a lot of good people for a long time, but he's really super intellectual, big time kinesiology background. And this is back in the 80s. So he was he was talking way over my head most of the time. I was just trying to catch what he was saying, trying to figure out and convert all that science into my body to figure out how to make myself better. So we were doing a lot of things ahead of the curve back in the day, like back in 88 and nineties, I was doing already doing pool workouts and, you know, we were doing the kind of stuff that people just start doing a couple of years ago, even, mm -hmm. you know, which has really helped my coaching cause ahead of the curve. So mm -hmm. we were always trying to find the, you know, the, the cutting edge of everybody, whether it was a therapist or different type of training, whatever else. So we were always on the edge. So um, my training, I, 
you know, confidence comes from preparation. And in my training leading up to the Olymp up to the world championships, my training told me I was ready to break the world record. Mm -hmm. And and then my last training session I had a personal best, and I was like, okay, let's go do it. So mm -hmm. you know, that was the plan. That's what we went in there to do. We had the. I mean, that, when I first met Randy in 1988, he said we got a four year plan to breaking the world record. He broke the world record the fourth year. Mm -hmm. And you know, it is always good when you have people with a lived experience that can help you to take the guess out of what you're doing. Because today, that is one of the things I find. Right. That a lot of people are focused so much on the physical, and none of them seem to want to spend a lot of time on the mental. And that's more important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, and that, if anything, that's the main thing I got from Carl Lewis. The mental toughness that it takes to be a world champion. Because the physicality... I mean, okay, you have your freaky athletes, LeBron, Usain, super duper tall, athletic, beyond that. But for the most part, the athleticism is almost the same. Who can think, who can do it at that moment, that mm -hmm. second, mm -hmm. and you do their best? Mm -hmm. That's what it takes. That's what makes a champion. And the thing is, I was able to do it sometimes, but I had Carl Lewis to compete against, so I have two silver medals. They would have been gold medals any other time, but the silver medals against him. Mm -hmm. So that's why when Bolt was running, I used to feel bad for those guys. They know they're going for second. They knew they were. I mean, most of them were trying, but how you going to sit next to somebody? He's over there popping, dancing. You, he know he about to win. I would have hated that. I'd been like, stop. <laughs> well, you see, you see, Mike, um, I know, and this is why I love the fact that you accepted the invitation to be on the show, because mm -hmm. I know there has to be or had to be a deep mental component to yes. your win. You are now a legend of all legend in the event. From 1991 right up until the second, you displayed athletic greatness. And that needs to be acknowledged because you perform in the moment. I tell you, I watched that, I watched that competition over and over. It was like a boxing match. You know, exactly your performance. Exactly. Exactly. And you, and you know what? That's a perfect explanation. It was a heavyweight boxing match. And we were going round for round, but and Carl was winning them, but I was getting some shots in, and I just went like, ah, boom, knocked his butt out. <laughs> well, still, he's still down. <laughs> I, I, I would encourage anyone watching this today to go back and watch it, um, because you know Carl had four to five of his best jumps in his career, and you came back. I want you to tell us the level of focus and how deep did you have to dig in the recesses of your mind to hold your composure and will yourself to that world record victory. I want you to share that. I was, I was so focused for the competition that starting about two or three days out from the competition, I wasn't really talking to anybody. I was in the athlete's village and people were speaking to me and I just was, in my zone and most people kind of who knew me they already knew already i was crazy like that but that was like most time on game day i started like three days out i was already just folk i was jumping in my head and i was just visualizing jumps and jumping fair jumps far jumps and i jumped the i don't know how many thousands of times in the days leading up to the competition in my head and the more you do that visualize you're just programming and um on the way to the stadium I was sitting on the bus and I had my headphones on. I was sitting next to a sprinter from LSU named is Esther Jones. And Esther was a good friend of mine. And I'm sitting there on the bus and I'm jamming my headphones, you know, my Walkman, you know, back in the day, Walkman. So I take my, my headphones off and I'm looking at these license plates. And I said, you see that license plate over there? If you take that number and that number, that's the world record in the women's um, long jump. Boom, I put my headphones back on. 
And she's looking at me like, okay. I took him off again. You see that right spin over there? That's the world record in the, uh, which call it, the, uh, the, the men's javelin. Blah, blah, blah. And she looked at me like, he is like really zoned right now. I was so focused. It was ridiculous, man. That, like I said, I went there to beat Carl and to break the world record. And I was not going to be determined. I was not going to be deterred. It didn't matter how far he went. If he went 30, I went 30 feet one. That was my day. It's like, it's like I walked in there like, I'm kicking your ass today. <laughs> Get him up. You ain't, you ain't leaving this room. The next time he got me, but not that day. <laughs> hey, while I was watching, while I was watching the competition, you know, um, it always seemed like Carl had some wind, just enough wind behind him. <laughs> right. And you weren't getting that wind at all. And you right. end up breaking the world record with 0 0.02. It was just a perfect night for you. I want you to tell the listener, how did that make you feel? After I'm you still, saw. I'm, I'm still smiling. It's a part of me. You know what I'm saying? I, especially now because I've had the world record for 30 years. I'm 58. I've had the world record longer, you know, more time than half, half more than half my life. Yeah. It's mine. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have a hard time giving it up. I hope, I hope, um, I hope Gail don't jump too far. I have to come down there and get him. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to break the world record, I mean, like anything, it's not just one thing. And to mm -hmm. me, it wasn't just the track meet. It was a microcosm of my life. Mm -hmm. It was me showing the world and myself that I was worthy and that I can do this. And every bad thing that happened to me in my life, every girl that turned me down for a date, every time somebody called me skinny, every time somebody <laughs> talked about I had nappy head and a peanut head and whatever else, and, and I, you know, whatever. Uh, that's for y'all, all y'all. Now what? <laughs> that's I, what it was all about. It was, I, I mean, because what happened, Carl jumped 891. And then after his response, after the jump, he was like, yeah, that's right. And looked at me like, yeah, that's right. And I was like, I'm the wrong dude, man. Don't do that to me. I'm going to jump over the building. And that's what he did. As soon as he did that, I stood up and I was like, I'm bummed. I'm going world record right now. It's just like, it was like I'm in the gym and somebody dunk, I come right back, boom, jump right back at him. So that's what it was. So I didn't get a chance to think. I was like only two jumpers away. So I just got on the runway and I was just mad. And I started yeah. to visualize and I could see it clearly. I was like, oh, this is it. Just go. So I started running. And the thing is, it would it would have been a lot further. But um, when I was in, I got really high on the jump. Because when I jumped, I tried to think about dunking from the free throw line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hit it on this one. So I got really high. And so normally on my landing, I hit the sand, turn sideways. I was in the air so high, I started turning sideways in the air. Mm -hmm. So if you if you ever watch the jump from the front, my feet landed, I landed sideways. If I went forward, it would have been 30 feet. It would have been like 920 something, mm -hmm. you know? So the thing is, I was just starting to figure it out then, actually, to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, you know, there's always bitter and sweet because I was watching – uh, some of your interviews after 1992 Barcelona games when you finished second. And it, it too was also an intense competition again with Carl Lewis. Right. How did you feel about that performance in 1992? And please explain why. And, and just as much as I feel happiness from breaking the world record, I still feel pain from 1992. That was the hardest athletic loss that I've ever had to um to deal with in my life because it was mine to get and i didn't i didn't compete as well as i should have and carl competed better i was a better jumper i just finished jump 899 i was running fast i wasn't even worried about carl i'm thinking Ooh, i'm gonna go 30 feet in the olympics i'm gonna be the super duper man and then you know um you know honestly what happened and like what happens to a lot of people is small things that make the difference mm -hmm. I had the best warm up in the history of mankind in Barcelona. I did a I did a pop up and a step out at in the warm up at 30 feet plus. I looked at my coach and he was like, he's reserved and his face was like, <gasps> and I was like, ooh wee, I'm about to do it again. And then, you know, what happened is that at the Olympics, 
it's about the ceremony, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So at a meet, normally, they say, okay, close the pit. Five minutes later, we start. At the Olympics in 92, not only did they close the, they closed the pit, but they took us back to the other side of the stadium, under the stadium, and then brought us back out for introductions. Mm -hmm. I was the last jumper. By the time I got on the runway, an hour went past. By the time I did my last approach, okay. my last jump, my body was asleep. So it took me a while for my body to come back. And then by the time it came back, I had my, my last jump. I ended up losing by three centimeters. Mm -hmm. If I'd have had one more jump, I would have probably won a world record. I went from mm -hmm. eight, I went from eight old whatever, eight meters, 790 something, all the way up to 864. One more jump, I'd have did it, but I ran mm -hmm. out of time. And Carl did his on this first. So like I said, he competed better. He was used to it. That was his third Olympics. And for me, man, it was that was the first time I was a star. So I was being, I was being rushed in the streets, signing autographs. You know, I was running to celebrities. I mean, I was in the same hotel, I was sitting down. And OJ Simpson came down, sat down next to me, and and I was like, wow, his head is big. <laughs> but I remember thinking about that, and I got on the elevator, and you know, Felicia Rashad, you know, from the Cosby Show, she was on the elevator. I loved her. I was like, oh my gosh! And then I'm competing. In the long jump, and this guy's yelling, come on, Mike, come on, Mike, come on, Mike. I'm like, who this dude yelling at me? I look over, and it's Spike Lee. <laughs> and I'm like, this is crazy. You know, it was too much for him. It was it was too much. And I still almost won, but you talk about the small. It was so many things going around me. I wasn't, and Carl was just like, ha-ha, I've been through this, been there, done that. So would you say your level of focus wasn't the same, like, say, in 92, or what is 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 It just couldn't be. There's no way. I'm not, I'm not trying as, good, as much as I could, but, you know, and plus, once when you, like, when I broke the world record, like I told you, that was all encompassing. That just wasn't the jump. It was my life. How you come back and top that? You know what I'm saying? Now, mm -hmm. I was hungry. Yeah. But how you gonna be, how you gonna be hungry after you ate? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I had a hell of a meal. I wasn't True. hungry no more. I was hungry, but I wasn't hungry. You know what I'm saying? Back and that's before. the difference. I wasn't hungry no more. And so, you know, the lifestyle catches up with you. You make different, different choices, bad, bad decisions. And, you know, you think you're right all the time. And everybody telling you how good you are. You know, that's what happens. That's why you need to have people around you tell you that your stuff stinks still. Cool. <laughs> that is so true. But one mm -hmm. thing we can say about you, though, Mike, that you always learn and come back stronger and better because in 1993 i was at that championship um in stuttgart where you end up winning the gold you medal. a young boy then weren't you yeah I was, that was my first <laughs> that was my first world championship i want to say um, I, remember, I remember i remember you I, that's why i thought you were young yeah <laughs> like 18 i was a freshman you. i was a freshman in college i made my first World Championship final. I was on the on the cloud, <laughs> man. I, you know, just scared. Don't know what to do. Yeah, I too was looking for a way, and this was my time. That's what I was saying to myself. But I want you to tell us, after '92 and based on you going through that, how did you manage and maintain and sustain that level of competitive edge after learning from '92, coming over to '93? Well, I mean, I've, I've always been really goal oriented and also dedicated and loyal. And I'm a, I'm a track geek, man. I just happen to be a world record holder. I love the sport. I'm a fan of the sport. You know, I know a lot of athletes now come talking to them. They don't even know who I am. I'm talking to them. And it's okay. I'm not, I'm not looking to like get a pat on the back. But when I, when I was brought into the sport and the era that I came from, we were taught to sell the sport. It wasn't just my job just to go jump. It's my job to entertain the crowd, to make sure they left feeling good. And not just because I jumped 850, but because I jumped 850 and I was dancing around and kissing babies and doing everything else. It was like the same. That's why I love when Bull was competing, because that's the kind of stuff I was doing over in the long jump. So mm -hmm. I was more of a personality, you know, out there. And that's why. And so people could feel how I was feeling because I wear my heart on my sleeve. So they felt the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to show that, you know, and a lot of people, and I'm I'm, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else, but I'm willing to put myself out there mm -hmm. and it's okay. It's like, 
I'm fortunate in that I say what comes in my mouth, and fortunately, my filter keeps me out of trouble. But I say <laughs> some stuff sometimes can be close to the edge. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you 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 just talk about the highs and the lows, and as a professional, former professional myself, I know by experience that the sport is filled with a lot of peaks and valleys. Oh my God. As you just mentioned, it highs and lows. So I want you to invite us into your mind. Can you share some of the challenges you experienced preparing for the Olympics and the World Championships and how you were able to overcome many of them to perform those legendary performances time after time, highs and lows, keep coming back? Yeah, that's the hard part, man. It's, all, it's, it's so mental because you put all the physical work in and then you got to put it together at that moment. And um, just keeping your head, keeping your sanity, keeping your focus is hard. That's what, like I said, that's what makes champions. I'm a champion, but I'm not the champion that I want to be. I never, I didn't win the Olympics. I had goals of doing other things. I went to start spring. I went to do the capital. I had really big dreams and stuff. So to me, I look at my career like, eh, that was pretty cool. You know, I don't, I feel like my world record should be further. But that's how we're wired. We mm -hmm. always want more. Look at me. I got a world record been 30 years old, and I still think it should be 30-something. I'm still, you know, we always want more. Mm -hmm. I still I want to jump now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they keep jumping 830 and we're in the games, man. They're going to bring me out. <laughs> um, I personally used to see you as one who were committed and determined and you really, truly wanted to dominate the jumps. Yeah. But I've also seen the struggles in terms of the trial and the errors due to your injuries. Yeah. What would you like younger athletes to know that can help them to preserve their careers as they face potential injuries or they are dealing with injuries right. in the moment? Right. Well, I mean, being being injured as an athlete is is just part of part of the game, especially being like a jump or something. Every event has their own thing, but when you're doing the jumps like that, man, you're really putting your body under a lot of duress. So the thing is, you have to make sure you do a lot of preventative injury things in your training. So it means you have to get a really good therapist. Having a great therapist is just as important as having a great coach. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you got to make sure you surround yourself with the right people. Understand your body. Understand how your body works. Understand how to recover. Underhand, understand. You have to, I mean, you have to do the work. Everybody's not going to tell you. You got to do the research. It's no excuses. Shoot, I wish I had an um, iPad back then. Boy, I didn't know anything. Before I had to read and ask questions. Now you get to do a surf and find out any answer that you want. So it's no excuse not to be educated on your body and how it works. Even yeah. just as a from an athlete spent a standpoint as far as performance, because I've been coaching now, but over the past couple of years, my coaching has gone to a whole nother level because of my understanding of the muscle firing sequence. So when I coach the athletes now, I'm really coaching them the movement, mm -hmm. how to apply forces to use the ground to push energy, kinetic energy through your body. That's the way my coach used to talk, like, huh? But the thing is, now I understand it. I didn't get it. If I knew this stuff back then, ooh wee, I for sure would have been sprinting. But mm -hmm. now I know what I was doing. I was bouncing down the track. You guys were pushing. I didn't know how to push. I was bouncing. Mm -hmm. Well, I so I know sometimes it's hard to get some of these younger guys to really pay attention. Yeah. But for the younger generation who might think it's all about the physical capabilities, I want you to share with us the importance. I know you say it over and over, but I want you to share with us again the importance of the power of your mind and mm -hmm. how you used the power of your mind to create such indelible and illustrious career for yourself. Well, you know... The one thing, I mean, there, I mean, the United States is, is great in a lot of ways, but there's, there's things about it, you know, that, that could be better. But one of the good things about the United States is that the overall belief is that we can do it. 
We can do it. We can accomplish it. We can win. We can do that. And I know athletically the connection between the United States and Jamaica, that's the common thing. It's like, you guys know we can do this. I'm from Jamaica. You got that pride. I'm from Jamaica, man. That's a little bit more. And same thing, well, I'm from the U.S. What's up? You know what I'm saying? So, like, we wear that proudly, and we'll buck up and do that. I've been in other countries, man, like working with kids in Japan and stuff. They're not, they're not wired that way. And over in Europe, they're they're wired to be more reserved and be more calm and don't put themselves out there. Whereas we're like, nah, I'm gonna do this, blah, 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 and put it out there because we speak it into existence. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And we do, that's part of our culture, both of our culture, you know what I'm saying? So we that's that's one of the big things right there. If mm-hmm. you have a dream, you have to cultivate it. So that means you got to think about it. You got to eat it, drink it, sleep it, live it. You got to make it you. Mm-hmm. What I do with now the coach, I paint the picture for my athletes if they can't do it themselves. But the reality is the reality that you make. You know what I'm saying? So the thing is, yeah. it's hard enough to do all the other stuff. But if you can take the, if you can take, because you're not in control of other stuff, but you somewhat in control of how you think. And you control if you control how your mind thinks, then you put yourself in a good situation to win. And even then, it's not guaranteed because you're going against somebody else. That is guaranteed. But you try to put yourself in the best situation possible. Mm-hmm. And it's just and I said learning from competing against Carl, I learned so much, man, from him. Like he got he got behind, and his face would never he would never be flustered. Only time he was when I put that world record on him. And I looked, <laughs> I, I looked at his face. I looked at his face. I was like, oh, I shook him. I shook him. It's the first time I shook him. And he looked at me. He looked at me like I was going to be talking mess. And I was like, I had my head down like, no, I ain't giving you nothing, brother. You know, no. You no. Know, here. Please you know, I was thinking the same record. thing when I watched that. And I, I would encourage those who are watching this now to go back and look at that world champion that, that that world championship in Tokyo, man, because exactly <laughs> what you said. I was looking on Carl's face, you couldn't read him. He would just yep. come down and he but 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 you know you said something that I um I'm very passionate about and I would love to get your views yeah. on this because I find that we as Jamaicans have a whole lot more in common with the Americans. Yeah. And I find that sometimes it seems like the rivalry get out of hand where we start to take it personal to some degree. Yeah. I love all American athletes. In fact, Michael Johnson was the one who gave me the opportunity yeah. to resurrect my career. I used to hang out with the Americans. And I, even though I competed against them, I never saw them as the enemy. Yeah. Based on your view, do you like what you see in terms of how the rivalry cause a division between us because we are indeed family we really are i mean i don't like it i like it as far as the, as far as what people do as far as motivating each other as far as competitively but i i remember the first time that i really knew something was wrong i was at the world championships and um i guess we we're in Mo- yeah we we're in moscow and um and uh, and um, Aunt Eaton, uh, the decathlete, he ran like, you know, 45 0, whatever. And, you know, I was in this up in the, you know, in the VIP, the, the IAAF stuff up there with, with a whole bunch of Jamaicans around me. And he ran the time. And I stood up like, whoa, man, 45 0. And I turned around and everybody looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, what's wrong? What are you? What's going on? And then I remember I was talking to one of the, I was talking to Tony Campbell, the agent, Tony Campbell, TC. Mm-hmm. He said, nah, man, it's different now, man. It's different now. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I like that anymore. They don't hate, like, they going ass. I said, what? I said, man, what's this like blood and blood and cuz? It's Crips and good blood? What's happening? Because the thing is, it's like, I compare it to like my situation being in college. Mm-hmm. I'm in a black fraternity. I'm an alpha. Black and gold. I'm not gonna hate on the Kappas. I'm not gonna hate on my brothers here in Vegas. I'm not gonna hate on the Sigmas. They my brothers. And when I was in school, 
even my own frat man to be like, oh, don't talk to them dudes. I'm like, man, shut up. Are you kidding me? It's another brother. We trying to get each, lift each other up. So I think the same way. Ain't no me for Jamaica, United States to be fighting. We all, we the same. Mm -hmm. That's we the same. We talking about, we admire each other. We are each other. And like I said, when I was coming up, like I said, man, all my peoples, man, my first trip over Europe, man, was over with Bert and Bert Cameron. When he was world champion, too, he was the man back then, too. You know what I'm saying? And all the just the royalty, man, the, you know, Juliet Culper, Juliet, my girl, you know, Merlene Adi, I said, Wintrip, man, you know, uh, James Beckford, man, I go on and on and on and on. That's family. Yeah. So now, to not to be that, I don't know what, the, I don't know how to handle it. Mm. What's, what's I, that about? I, I appreciate your views on that because even though I do the less talk, it's about me highlighting everyone's career, whether you're from America or Jamaica. Wherever. Because at the end of the day, it's all about how we can inspire the next generation That's to right. have great performances after performances. So I personally appreciate your views on, on, on that. And I think that more people like yourself need to come out and let them understand that the culture where sometimes it seems like we're pitting against each other. Yeah, we we're not, we're not against each other. But no, <laughs> nobody, I mean, but nobody happier for any of the island countries, man. So like when Bahamas, you know, wins a medal in the relay, we know how much it means to the Bahamas. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. when, when we know what auto means to Trinidad, you know, we know what that stuff means. You know, so it's like, come on now. We proud too. Mm. We want y'all to invite us down there. Mm. <laughs> we Look, want to come I, hang out. I, I appreciate your perspective on that because that's what it should be about. You know, we were college roommates. We compete. We want the same thing for ourselves and our families. So uh, oh, I, we I all related. You know that. Come on now. We all, everybody, got, everybody got a little Jamaican in them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A little something too. Everybody got a little white in them too. Come on now. Keep it real. <laughs> that lose you? Okay. I don't know how to keep seeing something popping up on my page. Okay. Um, you have always stressed, Mike, the importance of setting clear goals. Stay focused on those goals. Yeah. Especially that you set for yourself. Yeah. You became a world champion and a world record holder in an event that is remarkable in my eyes. And we talk about it, we laugh about yeah. it, and I'm sure we learned a lot from that determination. Yeah. You have also done remarkable things in the face of adversity. Could you tell us your secret? How were you able to pick yourself up multiple times and keep on moving forward? time and time again well you know i mean for me you know that's where like i'm really glad that i was born in philly man that kind of that that inner city toughness of not feeling sorry for yourself and giving up i mean you have to always acknowledge the situations are hard but it's like to not give up and to fight and just know that if I put the work in, I'm going to get a positive result. And I've always felt that way. I mean, I mentioned about my, my, about Willie being like my idol, but another person who really motivated me growing up was my brother. My brother um, got a kunga drum. He was 15 years old. And I remember I was six. We were sharing a room. He's a play it all the time. You're going to tell him I'm going to be the best percussion in the world. Practicing all the time, all the time, all the time, years and years and years. So let's fast forward, what, 50 something, 50 years now. And so now for the past 35 years, my brother's been in percussions for Kenny G and Diana Ross. And he's been one of the top percussions in the world. And he's self-taught self from hard work. So he showed me from a long, long, a young age, if you put the work in, you're going to get the result. And even if you don't get the, the big result, which is why you got to shoot high, because if you don't, if you shoot, if you fall short, you're still going to be out there in some lovely territory. Mm -hmm. He's still doing some positive things. And then even if it's not that, it's going to be something else that's a tangent into something else. Because I was doing this, I met this person. And now I'm over here doing this. And now I'm Dr. Dr. Greg Cotton now. You know what I'm saying? That's how that stuff works. 
you know, yeah. so I just try to make sure that, you know, people out there put your mind to something, have a goal, work hard and trust and have faith that something good is going to come out of it because it is just because you put the work in. And that is the word from the wise. Mm -hmm. Looking back at your career, Mike, do you have any regrets? And if so, why? A bunch of them. But that's life. You know, mm -hmm. you live and you learn. Sometimes the only way to learn is to put your hand that fire and learn that it burns. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I mean, I like, I love life, man. I've always, I've always liked to have a lot of fun and stuff. And there were sometimes my mate had a little too much fun and not a little, not enough serious sometimes. So I wish I would have had somebody maybe sometime to grab me and pull me back. But you know, I realized at the time when somebody's doing well, it's kind of hard to tell them they're not doing right. So that's where you need to have people. That's where you need to have your people to say, mm -hmm. hey, come here, Mike, you tripping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you're saying right now don't sound right, homie. What's up? You need mm -hmm. that. You know what I'm saying? And unfortunately for me, I had buddies around who would still call me peanut head. So I always never stay too far away from where I was. You 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 have been through it all in regards to your career. What would you say is the most important lesson you have learned? Man. Uh Enjoy, enjoy the moment because you never know. You know, enjoy the moment because I think back like I mean, I'm blessed now that I'm still an ambassador for you know for World Athletics and I still get to go around the world and do appearances and traveling and stuff. But when I think about the fact that I spent my 20s and more and half my 30s traveling around the world, getting paid to jump in some dirt. People paid me to do that. So I get I get a chance to go experience different cultures all around the world and meet different people and stuff. So it's like, I'm happy because I remember there was times when we'd be over there in Europe and people would be sitting up in their rooms. I'm like, man, I'm going out. I'm going out into the city. I'm about to go have dinner with this family and find out what's really going on in Germany. What are they talking about? That kind of stuff. So I always manage to stay in the moment and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a blessing if you can do that, because a lot of times people don't realize the, the gift that they have in the present. You know, we, we need to be reminded, man, it's, we, especially now. But, you know, as we get older and stuff, you know, well, I am at least, you know, you look good still. But, anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> hey, especially with COVID and people pass, man, people are gone. They weren't here last year. You know what I'm saying? And then mm -hmm. I, and that's especially now for me, I mean, I'm almost 60. There's a lot of people of my friends who are dying from natural causes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I'm and I'm like this, bro. I'm going to a hundred at least. I don't know about <laughs> y'all. That's well, why I stay fit. My stuff well, is fit, man. I'm fit. I learned my lesson. Edwin told me I was fat a while ago, a couple of years back, maybe 10, 15 years ago, when Edwin got on me, said, man, diabetes, and this Edwin was always on me. Willie was on me. Now I'm the fit guy, so now it's my turn to motivate everybody else. You know, when I was doing the research on you, I realized that you are exactly 10 years older. We were on the same day. I'm November 10th. What? You are November 10th. What? Oh, man. No, we I know are... I like you for a reason, bro. Yeah. I can't mess you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Got that Scorpio love, baby. Can't yeah, stop that so Scorpio. <laughs> I understand you more because it's like I'm dealing with myself. Right. Um, before I go, Mike, yeah. what would you like others to know about you that they don't already know? And that's my final um, Man, it, 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 it. I, I just try to be happy and I'm like, and I just like, man, if somebody doesn't like me, they don't like the fact because I'm happy. That means something's wrong with you. Other than that, I'm just trying to be happy and spread love, you know, and if anybody has ever misinterpreted that, I apologize, but I'm always just trying to be me and be happy and do the right thing. That's all. And I stand by it and I'm, and I'm willing to say that I was wrong and willing to say I'm sorry. 
and I'm always willing to learn. So I'm out there learning stuff all the time. I, I coach young athletes, and I learn stuff from them every day. Mm. You know, Mike, I appreciate you coming on this platform. It's one of the few times I get the opportunity to talk to a world record holder. As I have said early, earlier in the introduction, that it is not how fast and how far you can run or jump. It comes down to your character, your personality. That's right. And I find you to have the complete package. That's right. It is a pleasure to have you on Let's Talk. I look forward to having more discussions with you. Hopefully, we can come and do another part two. Anytime, bro. <laughs> any 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 subject, man. I'm I'm good. I'm do. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> right. So I'm gonna play this. Um, I'm gonna close, and hopefully, we can we can chit chat some more because you are the greatest long jumper in the history of the event. And I'm proud to have you on this show. Thank you very much, my brother. Thank you, brother. Hey, but I have to say this, though, man. I have the best jump, man. But Carl, the best jumper ball. I'm, I'm, number, I'm number two. I'm a close second. Me and Pedroso, but Carl's number one. You it's see, it's humility. Humility. And I appreciate that. I won't, I I won't argue real, with bro. that. Because... Hey, if, if I was, I'd be saying it. Trust. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I> should be. <laughs> you're the best jump in the world, but Carl is truly a legend. Hopefully, to get hopefully I can get him on the show one day. Good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and may God bless and keep you and your family safe. Um, Amen, Greg. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. All right. All right. Let's go. Take care, man.